Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the of your hands forever I'll love you forever I'll stand nothing compares to the promise I have nothing compares to the promise I have nothing compares to the promise I have in Welcome to worship at the New Horizons Christian Church. I'm going to start out today by uh, lifting up our uh, most recent update with respect uh, to worshiping back together in our sanctuary and knowing that no matter what we put out there, circumstances might change. But this is, uh, this is our plan uh, until the end of 2020. And I'll just read it and uh, there won't be any questions. We are committed to caring for the physical and spiritual health of our New Horizons Christian Church community. With that in mind, again, commitment to physical and spiritual uh, health. Here's our worship plan. Again, this is through the end of December. This takes us through um, the Sunday after Christmas. One, we will continue to offer online worship on our YouTube channel. No matter what we do in terms of having uh, in-person worship, we're always gonna have uh, online worship because we know that's the most important option for a lot of folks. Two, and this has to do with actually just the next couple of weeks, but uh, we've been open for prayer on Sunday mornings and it's gonna be this way uh, when you see this, which is gonna be Sunday, November 15th or beyond. Actually, Sunday, November 22nd as well. The sanctuary is gonna be open, but we're doing something interesting on the 22nd. Uh, at the very beginning part of worship, maybe 9.30 to 10.30, the sanctuary is going to be open if you want to come in and pray, light a candle. But we're going to be putting out some of the hanging of the greens uh, things to put up. So during Sunday, November 22nd, if you want to come and you want to begin to put some of the stuff up for the Christmas season, that's going to be available to you. But here's the big deal. Starting November 29th, which is the uh, first Sunday in Advent, happens to also be the uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. We're gonna be worshiping together in the sanctuary. We're gonna have two worship services. First one's gonna be at nine, and the second one's gonna be at 1045, and those are times that are familiar to a lot of our church family. And each of these services is gonna be the same, about 30 to 35 minutes in length. And the kinds of things that we've been doing all along or you've been doing when you go in a grocery store are part of what we're gonna be doing during those services, i.e. you gotta wear a mask, Social distancing is gonna be required in practice. We've already kind of figured that out with the pews. We're not gonna have congregational singing because uh, we've heard that that's one of the ways to really spread uh, the coronavirus is for singing. And communion and offering are gonna be the same way we were having it at our outdoor service. And at the first service, we're gonna be recording it then to put on later in the day. So two services starting November 29th, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, about 30 to 35 minutes in length. 
and we're certain we've got enough room to everybody to spread out and to be apart from one another. However, if it turns out that more people come than we think, we're gonna put a third service. We'll do some, we'll find some way to accommodate everybody, but we're starting out with two. Again, nine and uh, 1045, and that's starting the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And we're gonna have these services as long as our county threat level is red or below. And I don't think it's gonna get below that red. If it gets to purple, then that changes everything. Uh, we won't have the in-person worship services. And we're gonna be evaluating week to week, almost service to service, just to make sure that things are going well. And if circumstances change, if needs change, if we get different direction from the state of Ohio, then we're gonna tweak that. And one of the things that we absolutely are gonna encourage everybody to do is just use your best judgment. Uh, we don't want anybody coming to worship thinking that uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. And if you don't feel well, don't come to worship. Uh, don't come until you feel better. So all the kinds of things that most of us have been doing all along, we're gonna to apply to those services. But we're excited that if it works out, we're gonna be able to worship on Sunday mornings during the month of December. And I think that's gonna be great. Um, we were talking about Christmas Eve services. One of the things we know is they'll be about, again, about 30 minutes in length. We'll give you more information on that to come. And one more thing about worship. Uh, the Sunday after uh, Christmas, which is the 27th, we're gonna have online worship only. And we're hoping to do a worship and wonder kind of event there. And some of our small groups have begun to meet in the building again. And that's the friendship class, Lord's workers class, Circle of Light has been meeting and they're doing the same kinds of things we're advising everybody else to do. Wearing masks, social distancing, and all that. And again, they're gonna to continue to meet as long as the threat level is red or below. If you get the blog, you're gonna get all this information again, but we wanted to announce it at least starting uh, this weekend because it's only a couple weeks away. So that's our plan. And one thing that we've learned to do during this particular season is be flexible. And that might change, but that's our plan for now. As we go into worship, I'm gonna be reading you something um, about Veterans Day, because Veterans Day was just a few days ago. It didn't happen on a Sunday. But I, uh, I saw this on the internet today and I thought it was the appropriate kind of thing to read. It really fits right now in our country. So this is a little um, Veterans Day, uh, kind of a, a way to think about it. It's from a woman named Debbie McDonald. Freedom is powerful, it's a gift, a treasure. The most significant important gifts in life are always worth fighting for. And often they come with a great price, they are not free. Somewhere along the way, someone paid dearly for the liberties we enjoy so freely today. But sometimes we forget, it's easy to take them for granted. We enjoy freedom, but most of us alive today have always had it. We may not even be fully aware of just how many men and women have paid dearly for the gifts we enjoy today. The price was paid through many long years. On the heels of a heated presidential race, this is a time to unite, to remember and to pray, to show our gratitude for so many who have fought on behalf of our country, for all those who have protected our nation, for the men and women in uniform. Together we say, thank you. And if we were gathered together in our sanctuary today, we would have those folks stand up so maybe if you're listening to this at home, go ahead and stand up, you deserve it. There's a great power and strength in the loyalty of your service because of these things. One, there's power in unity and standing strong together. Two, there's power in fighting on behalf of our nation and for those who cannot fight for themselves. Three, there's power in rising up in courage, pursuing victory for what's right. Four, there's power in knowing that God himself fights on our behalf. And five, there's power in prayer. And there's power in prayer in the one who sets us free. And thank you veterans for reminding us that there's incredible love and sacrifice displayed when one is willing to stand strong and fight for freedom. The service of love and sacrifice on behalf of all people points us directly to the greatest love of all, the very gift and sacrifice of Christ. Our Savior was willing to pay the ultimate price so that we can live free forever. Let us pray. Oh God, we do give you thanks. We do give you thanks for this time of worship. And some of us are gathering together today 
in the sanctuary. Some are gathering at home. Some just might be watching this on their phone. In whatever way, Lord, we're worshiping today, we worship together, we worship in you. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel your power. Let us be directed and consoled. Let us receive today, Lord, what you know we need. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. One of the themes of this uh, particular year, I think, for our church is generosity and how much people have given in how many ways. Uh, and the giving to this church, in some churches it's been a worrisome thing, in our church it's been something we celebrate. And people have given in terms of food, people have given in terms of time to help others, people have, are assembling those uh, Thanksgiving baskets we're going to be giving out in another week or so. Some people have sent checks, some people have brought money in, some people are using the Giblify app. In whatever way, in whatever amount that you have been generous with the church, we are so grateful because you're putting us in a position to make faithful decisions, not fearful decisions. So for the gifts you've given, the gifts you'll continue to give, we give you thanks. Thank you. Well, we made it. <laughs> we have come to our last session in Sunday in our Dream Big series. And this last week is called Landing the Plane. Now, I am not a pilot. The only thing I know about flying is that I love taking off and landing. They're my favorite parts. But that's about all I know. I was, however, lucky enough to know a pilot. My grandfather, he wasn't a commercial pilot. He only flew small planes, but he loved it. My grandparents, they had my mother uh, on the later end of the childbearing spectrum. So by the time my brother and I were old enough to really be taught things, like big things by my grandparents, they were kind of on the backside of teaching. So by the time I was old enough to take an interest in flying and learning how to do that, my grandfather's teaching days weren't what they used to be. And so his place was focused more on being the passenger rather than the teacher. However, without knowing it, there was one time that he did teach me a flying lesson that I've never forgotten. When I was about 12, me, my mom, my aunt, my grandparents, we took a trip back east to Massachusetts. That was where my grandparents were originally from. That trip wasn't one that you would call a really adventure-packed trip for a 12-year-old, but it was a trip that ended up making a lifelong impact on me. When I was invited to go on this trip, because I did have a choice, when I was invited, all I knew was that we were going to Massachusetts and we were gonna learn more about our family and our ancestors. That would involve meeting family members who were still living, cousins, second cousins, great aunts and uncles. The part that I didn't know about the trip until it was too late to say no, was that that trip was gonna spend a lot of time in cemeteries, learning more about people who had come and gone long before I had. I'm not lying, not trying to make it up. That, a lot of that trip was just plain old boring. There's only some, so many cemeteries you can walk around before you're just like, this is not fun. There were highlights. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't all bad. One of those highlights for me was listening to my grandparents reminisce and talk about the town they used to live in, the things they would do, friends that they would meet at certain spots, Ponds they would sneak into and swim in in the middle of the night without clothes on. It was great. There was one pretty fond memory I have, and it happened by a big empty field. We were driving along, and my grandpa told my mom, pull over, pull over. So we stopped, and she's like, well, what's going on? He goes, you see that field right there? He goes, I, that's the field I used to fly my plane in and out of. Again, I'm no pilot. We know I like landing and taking off, but one thing I didn't remember that I do know about flying is that runways for taking off and landing, they are much, much larger than the field that we were looking at. It seemed impossible 
to think that at some point my grandpa flew a plane in and out of there. Nothing about those two things looked like they worked together. So I asked my grandpa, was the field just like this back then when you used to fly in and out of there, or was it bigger? He said, no, it was pretty much the same. So I then asked him how he managed to take off and land his plane without crashing into the trees. He said, I didn't crash into the trees, but I clipped a few a time or two. And then he said, if I wanted to fly, I had to take the risk because you can't fly without taking off or landing the plane. So I had no choice but to give it a go. Today's scripture that I'm going to read in a minute, I think it speaks to another similar view on that idea. The, the letter from the scripture of James, it's addressed to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And that is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1. And then I read more about the setting and circumstances surrounding this book. And I just found the scenario to be really familiar. The notes about this book say, James wrote as pastor to instruct and encourage his dispersed people in the face of their difficulties. I don't know about you, but I feel like we are dispersed people these days. And let's be honest, we have all faced some difficulties this year, haven't we? For a number of people in our church, especially these past few months and even weeks, the difficulties have been pretty substantial. So yes, this text really speaks to me as relevant, not just for this dream big stuff we're doing, but it just speaks to where we are, I think, as a church right now. So here's the text. It's James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The whole scripture to me is really powerful. But this verse 22, it just kept jumping out at me and jumping out at me. It says, his faith was made complete by what he did. This was huge. Because most of the things we do in life take two parts, don't they? You can make something, but then you have to do something else with that product. You can have something, but what good is it if it is not put into action? You can have food. You can sh stare at it all pretty and nice for days and days. 
But unless you actually consume it, eventually it goes bad and it's a waste. It does nothing, it has no purpose. So this point James makes about Abraham, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. I just think that's so powerful. I mean, anyone can write a check to pay a bill, right? But until the bank cashes it, it doesn't mean anything. Your transaction hasn't been made complete. You can have faith in God, but what is it accomplishing if your faith isn't followed by actions to affirm that faith? Just the other day, a person was talking about someone they know who said they were a Christian, but they didn't do things that backed that up. They didn't live their life with actions that showed what they claimed they believed. So what good did it do for this other person who was seeking a partner in faith? if they couldn't see any action to show how this person was living a life they claimed. This dream big material we have been working on these past several months has been interesting. I've tried to come up with many different words to explain it because I feel like I have used the word interesting a lot this year about a lot of things. But I can't come up with another one, or at least one that maybe isn't appropriate. So I'm sticking with interesting. And I have personally found this material to be challenging, more so than I originally expected. And I'm only gonna claim that for myself, but I have had some conversations with a few people, and I can say that while not everyone maybe has felt this way, I think there are some other people that have felt similar. The first time I read this book, I was all excited. I was energized, but I, I think that's because I didn't really do work with it, I just read it. And then we started doing this series. And I started us off with three really big questions. Who are you, where are you, and what do you want? And unlike the first time I breezed through those questions, the second time around with them stung quite a bit. Facing the honest truths about those questions, realizing that I needed to do some hard work to really understand who I am, where I am, and what I want, was kind of scary because I was a little afraid of what I might reveal to myself about myself. I've done a good job of keeping many things tucked away, and to think that this was going to cause me to have to unpack some of those things, it made me rather uncomfortable. Despite being uncomfortable and a bit of sure, unsure of what to do all, with all of it, we had to move on. The next step was setting absurd expectations, which meant having big, hairy, audacious goals. My year had been pretty big and hairy already, and the most audacious goal I could think of was simply to make it through 2020 with my family still in one piece. While feeling like a one-armed paper hanger, which is, I believe, how the expression goes, trying to figure all of this out, I knew I couldn't stay stuck there because we had to move on to the next step of clearing the path. Perhaps that is why I am not a plant person. I very much dislike pulling weeds. At camp, when a cabin does not follow the quiet after taps rule, well, at least in the past when I was a camper, anyways, and we didn't follow the quiet after taps rule, sometimes we would have to pull weeds during free time as our punishment. It really, really wasn't a big deal. But to be pulling weeds during free time while everyone else was swimming and boating and doing crafts and having fun, that really, really stunk. And that's kind of how I felt about pulling my weeds and clearing my path during this series. It really stunk. But move along we did, which brought us to last week, pushing through setbacks. 
I am familiar with setbacks. When we were buying our house several months ago, it felt like all we did was encounter setbacks. The sellers were very difficult to work with. Our bank was a pain in the neck. They kept messing up our paperwork, which kept delaying when we would close on the house. And we finally got to the point where we were like, maybe it's time to stop pushing. We spent a lot of time in prayer over those months, and especially that final night when we were trying to decide if it was time to abandon ship. But we did the final things we were asked to do, and we gave it one last push. And we're glad we did, because that last push helped everything finally come to fruition. But those setbacks, they were hard and they hurt. I cried a lot during that time. It was very stressful. It was so rough in so many ways on our family. But we learned a great deal from that experience, especially that pushing through when things are difficult may not be easy. But there is another side you make it to. You just got to keep pushing. You can cry along the way. You can hurt. You can even press pause and say, I just can't do it today. But once you've done what you need to do, you catch your breath, and then you get back to pushing because the other side is waiting. Now, here we are today in our final step, landing the plane. In the Dream Big book, Bob Goff gives a great example of things you have to do right before you land the plane. And his analogy and imagery is really great of what it means to put your dreams into action. But because I'm not a pilot, I struggle to convey his message quite the same as he does. But because I knew a pilot, and that pilot's message seems to add an additional take on this last step, I think it fits here to complement what Bob says. And that message is, if you want to fly, you have to take the risk because you can't fly without taking off and landing the plane. So you have no choice but to give it a go. It's not flying if you just sit in the plane on the ground and never go anywhere. I don't know what your lo runway looks like. I don't know how long or wide or how many trees line the sides. I don't know. But what I do know is that God gave us this one life, this one precious, amazing, sometimes painful, sometimes crazy, but marvelous life. And no, things aren't always great. As a matter of fact, things can be pretty crummy sometimes. Like Jim said last week, it happens. And for some of us, it sure seems like we have a lot of, had a lot of it happen this year. But despite all of the it, what we do with this life matters. Having dreams and living them out, that matters to God and that matters to this world. If God didn't need us to have dreams and ambitions that we risk doing in this world, then I think life would look a lot different. And I also think the Bible would read and have a completely different story. So if your dream big experience these past few months was more difficult than you had hoped, and you're still struggling to figure out what your dreams are, or even just trying to figure out who you are, or where you are, what you want, just let those seeds be planted. And just don't stop taking the risk to figure it out. You may clip a few trees taking off or landing. Heck, you might even rash, crash the whole plane and that might happen, who knows? But do what you need to to circle back around and try again. This last step is called landing the plane. But as a very wise and amazing man told me one time, if you want to fly, you have to take the risk. You can't fly without taking off and landing the plane. So you have no choice but to give it a go. 
Amen. We are now at our time of communion, so if you don't have your communion elements, you might want to go get those real quick. Communion is such an incredible time in this church because it just really connects us in a way as a community that really not much else that we do can. And I have picked up this expression somewhere along the line, but I love it. We are people of the table, and I just absolutely think that's incredible because we just expand that invitation to all people in all ways and i think it's just incredible that no matter where you are who you are you're invited to the table to experience god's love in such a profound way with your whole self as a whole body so as we come to this time of communion just know that all are welcome all are invited and we are just glad you are here because you matter let us begin this time at the table with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come remembering that night when Jesus sat with his disciples and he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, when supper had ended, he took the cup and he said, this cup is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. It is the cup of the new covenant for you. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, uh, that we might know you and your amazing grace. Lord, we thank you for this bread and cup which represents your body and shed blood on the cross. Open our eyes, our heart, and our mind to receive you. Amen. So now, at this time, we take the bread and the cup to experience God's love with our whole selves as a whole body. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of this day and the gift of this time to come together as a community of faith, whether we are near or far, and to just worship you and to experience your love in the ways that we get to in this sacred time together. And we pray that you just continue to guide and lead us through all the things that we do and just affirm in us your love for us through all different ways and people and build strength in us to be your light and love out in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. As we go, let us go in grace, peace, love, and hope. Amen. Father, I adore. 